Good morning and welcome to the worship service at the Village Church here in Garden City, Utah. I'm glad you've joined us for a message from the book of Revelation, a message about heaven. What a wonderful subject to consider. If you've been with us over the past year as part of our church, you know that we've been in the book of Revelation for most of that time. In fact, today's message is number 32 in the series, and we have one more to go next week, Lord willing. So I want to encourage you to turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 21, or if you're using a Bible app on your phone, you can look up that text, Revelation chapter 21. In 1931, songwriter Norman Clayton wrote the words and music to a beautiful old hymn. Verse 1 goes like this, If we could see beyond today as God can see, should all the clouds be rolled away, the shadows flee, over many griefs we would not fret, each sorrow we would soon forget, for many joys are waiting yet for you and me. None of us can see into the future with our physical eyes. We can't even see what's going to happen later today, but through the indwelling Holy Spirit and through the pages of Scripture, we can see with spiritual eyes what the future holds. And that's what the book of Revelation is all about. Its real title is the Revelation of Jesus Christ, and it enables us to glimpse into a bright future that God has planned for His children by faith, through grace, because of his son, Jesus Christ. And God the Holy Spirit used the Apostle John to record for us a visual and verbal snapshot of the person of Jesus Christ. That's what chapter 1 is all about. Then in chapters 2 and 3, we have an amazing insight into the life of the early church in Asia Minor. In chapter 4, we got to take a look at the body of Christ already raptured or caught away and up in heaven before the tribulation period begins. In chapter 5, there was a vision, an inspiring vision of Jesus himself opening the seven seals on a scroll that details all the events of the future. And then in chapters 6 through 19, we saw detail after detail of those trumpet judgments and bold judgments that are yet to come on the earth. In chapter 20, John revealed very clearly what's going to happen to our arch enemy, Satan, who's going to be cast into the lake of fire forever. And today, after a very long break, we get to see what John saw and what John heard about heaven. And what an amazing revelation it is. We're going to consider chapter 21 all the way down through verse 5 of chapter 22. That's a total of 32 verses. Now, it's pretty obvious we're not going to be able to take time to look at each of those 32 verses. So I want to encourage you to make your own way through that passage. Study it this afternoon. Study it this coming week. Get your Bible out and turn to Revelation 21 and the first part of chapter 22. But I want to take this brief time together this morning to examine what the Apostle John saw and what he heard. Those are the two simple points of the outline, what John saw and what he heard. And I want to zero in on those two words, saw and heard, because I want us to see what the Holy Spirit wants us to see and hear what the Word of God would have us hear and understand from this final book of the Bible. I'm convinced that we can learn much about our future home and it'll give us a greater hope and a greater joy as we discover what God has prepared for those who love him. In 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, the Apostle Paul writes, No eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. What that says to me personally is that even John's vision today, it's an inspired text of scripture, but it doesn't tell the whole story of how awesome heaven is. We get a look at that through the whole Bible, but it's going to be amazing to live there with our Savior 
and our loved ones who have gone before us. So with that backdrop, we're going to dive into the text to see what John saw and hear what John heard. First of all, what John saw. Verse 1 begins with three key words, then I saw. We immediately come up with that phrase, a phrase that John uses 44 times in the book of Revelation. What that means to me is that as soon as John got that vision of what's going to happen to Satan and his followers, then John was graciously given this beautiful vision of heaven by contrast. Now we can't take it all in, but we're going to check out some of the things that John saw. And I believe we're going to be blessed by what we learn or what we're reminded of if we've studied this before. First of all, he saw a new heaven and a new earth. Why that word new? A new heaven, a new earth. The answer is because the first earth and the first heaven or heavens, the atmosphere, passed away. Why did they pass away? Because they were tainted by the long-term effects of sin, going all the way back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The next thing John saw in his vision was the holy city, the new Jerusalem. There's that word again, new. Not the original Jerusalem here on planet Earth has been the center of controversy and conflict between nations for a long, long time. That controversy, that conflict, those nations themselves are going to be gone forever someday. Following that fantastic view of the new Jerusalem, John gets a vision of Jesus Christ sitting on the throne, and he has a message for John to write down. We're going to examine that in a few moments. But right now, I want us to notice that John saw seven angels who poured out one of the seven bowls of God's righteous judgment on a sin-cursed earth and on all those who have rejected Jesus Christ throughout history. That's when John is carried away in the spirit to a huge mountain. And from the height of that mountain, John could see this new Jerusalem, the holy city, the city that will house the church and all believers, Old and New Testament alike. The text tells us that the glory of God is the central feature of this city that John saw, a city of radiance, of brilliance, of light and reflection of light. It's a city that has a high wall and 12 gates around those walls, three on each side, with the 12 tribes of Israel written on them. That's a reminder to me that God loves and honors the people of Israel who know him and who believe on Jesus as their true Messiah. We read that that wall has foundation stones under it, 12 of them, that have the names of the 12 apostles on them. And that reminds me of the church, today's modern day church, and the church that's been in existence since the day of Pentecost. In, Act, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul says that that church, the true church, is built on a foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone. John tells us that this angel who spoke to him has a measuring stick, and he measures the city, and it is huge. According to the text, it's also the same width and length and height, or in other words, it's a cube. It's a city that is more than big enough to handle all of the people who have put their faith in God throughout human history. It tells us also here that it's measured by human measurements, that the angel uses human measurements. What that means is that this is not a symbol. It's not a word picture. It's an actual city, a city that will be 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, and 1,500 miles high. So if we were to place that city 
on planet Earth, starting, say, with one edge at New York City, it would stretch all the way across 1,500 miles, almost all the way across North America. And the height of it, if we figured modern day skyscrapers with many floors, about every 12 feet, this building could have 600,000 floors. <laughs> the wall of that foundation is over 200 feet thick, again, by human measurement. It's made of pure gold. And the foundation stones underneath are beautiful, varied, colorful stones. Think now for a moment with me about what John didn't see. He talks about that here. He didn't see, for example, the temple. Because God and Jesus are the temple. God in his beauty is the one we will worship and adore. Jesus Christ, the head of the church, is the one we will adore. John also didn't see the sun or the moon. And that's because God's glory gives the city light. And Jesus, the Lamb of God, as he's called in this text, is also the lamp of God that will never go out. John also didn't see anything unclean or detestable or false. All of that is going to be gone forever from the presence of God. And it means that as Christians, when we're there, we're not going to have to think about what life was like on earth during these days of sin and debauchery. Finally, back to what John did see, he saw a river of life flowing from the throne in the middle of the city and 12 different fruits that grow on the tree of life on either side of that divine highway. I love what the late Dr. Warren Wiersbe says in his commentary on the book of Revelation. He calls this new Jerusalem Garden City. I like that because I live in Garden City, and I love this place. I want to emphasize two things that we need to think about before we consider what John heard. First of all, in chapter 21, verse 10, John says that he was in the Spirit. He said the same thing in chapter 1, verse 10, at the start of this magnificent revelation of Jesus Christ. He was in the Spirit. And from what we know from our Bibles about being in the Spirit is that any Christian can live their life in the Spirit, not just the apostles like John. Galatians 5.16 talks about us walking in the Spirit. The book of Jude, verse 20, talks about praying in the Spirit. And Colossians chapter 1, verse 8 speaks of loving each other in the Spirit. So what we learn then is that being in the Spirit means being under the control of the Holy Spirit, being in line with the Holy Spirit, or my personal favorite definition, being under the power of and the enablement of the Holy Spirit. So you, if you know Jesus as Savior, have the Holy Spirit living in you, as I do. And you can serve him effectively in the Spirit. The question is, are you willing to let him enable you and empower you to do his will and to serve God? Will you do that? That's the question. We're going to have an opportunity in heaven someday to serve God for all of eternity. I'm not sure what that's going to look like and if it's 24-7, so to speak. But the second thing I want to think about is that we discussed what John saw in this text. And I want to emphasize that because we too can see what is most important to see spiritually, and we can process that in our daily lives with God's help. Paul prayed for us about that. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, Paul prayed that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. 
one of the greatest blessings we have is that we can see with those spiritual eyes, the eyes of our hearts, Paul calls it. We can see the wonderful inheritance that's waiting us, eternal life in heaven for all saints, all believers. And we get to experience that because of God's grace. That means if you know Jesus as Savior, and I trust that you do, then we're talking about you and me. If you don't know Jesus as Savior, I have to tell you, according to the Bible, according to the Bible, that you are spiritually blind. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, the God of this world, or Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that they might not see the light of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Satan doesn't want you to see Jesus for who he really is. But that can change today. And so I invite you to pray a simple prayer, to say to God in prayer, right where you are, right there in your living room, to say to God in prayer, I want that free gift of salvation. I believe that Jesus died on a cross for me on that first Good Friday. I believe that he rose again from the dead and that he's offering me the gift of eternal life forgiveness of all of my sins. I'm here to tell you that if you do that, believing by faith, you will see how wonderful God is. You'll see how awesome Jesus is as your Savior from sin. And you'll experience heaven someday when you leave this world for the next. Now let's go back and consider what John heard. We talked about what he saw. Now let's talk about what he heard. And the main thing I want you to consider is that John heard many promises from the Lord, from Jesus himself. I want to focus on that because as we study our Bible, we become aware that God is a promise-making, promise-keeping God. There's no doubt about that. That's a truth about God that cannot be challenged. By his very nature, he keeps his word. Gloria and I have been reading the book of Isaiah recently in our devotions as part of our devotional time, two chapters a day. And we've been taking note of all the promises. We finished the book this past Friday. And what we discovered is, is that in those 66 chapters of Isaiah, God gives us 1,066 promises. <laughs> well, here in 32 verses... God gives us, guess what, 32 promises. Jesus says to John in verse 5 of chapter 21, these words are trustworthy and true. In other words, I keep my promise. I am the Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning and the end. And Jesus says that he promises the spiritually thirsty person a drink from the springs of the water of life. And he says, you don't even have to pay for it. It's free. Jesus paid the price for that gift of life, pictured by that spring of living water. These words are trustworthy and true. God promises all true believers. He calls them overcomers or conquerors. He promises us a beautiful heritage. That heritage is this. God is our God. We are his children. I can say today, God is my God. I am his child by faith. And nothing and no one can change that. So those who are conquerors in Christ, every believer who's walking with the Lord, Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 37, actually that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We can take God at his word. We can take Jesus and his words to be trustworthy and true. I can say today, God is my God. You can say today, if you know Jesus the Savior, I am a child of God. Jesus promises, beginning in verse 24, that nations and kings will bring the glory of their kingdoms into that new Jerusalem. He also promises that nothing unclean 
will ever enter that city, particularly unclean people, but rather only those whose names are in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that's a statement that's true of every single Christian. Your name, if you're a believer, is in that Lamb's Book of Life, and mine is there as well. In verses 3 to 5 in chapter 22, he promises that God's throne will be central in the city and that his servants, his children, will serve him there. What a wonderful privilege. We will get to see Jesus face to face and have his name written on our foreheads and that will prompt us to want to serve him any way he chooses to use us. But the most inspiring promises are found in chapter 21, beginning in verse 4. I call them inspiring promises because they deal with our life right now, our real, raw human existence here and now. And I call them no more promises, no more death, no more mourning over all the problems of our world, no more crying. In fact, our tears will be wiped away and no more pain of any kind, physical, emotional, psychological. All the things we experience now that are negative will be gone forever. You and I both know that no mere human being can make promises like that. Only God can. So I pray as I wrap up this message that we all will see what God has prepared for those who love him and that we'll all be excited to contemplate heaven as our final destination. I pray too that we will hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to us in our hearts and minds, that we'll ponder the Word of God every day, that we'll read the promises God has made, thousands of them, and we'll know that He will keep them, every one of them, and He gets all the praise. So Norman Clayton was right. Many joys are waiting yet. I want to pray for us as we close this time together, and then I invite you to stay tuned, and you'll be able to hear some wonderful hymns about heaven. That bring praise to God. But let me pray right now. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the book of Revelation, especially this latter part of the book that talks about the glories of heaven. I thank you for the promise that those who know Jesus the Savior will be in heaven someday, in your presence, face to face with Jesus forever, and that we'll have the privilege of serving you for all of eternity. And I pray today for anyone who's watching who isn't sure if they know Jesus as Savior, that today they'll make sure right where they are, right there in their home. Give their heart to you and trust you as Savior. And then know with assurance that someday they'll be in heaven too. I thank you for that wonderful truth. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thank you for joining me today. Please stay tuned and uh, listen in on these hymns. If you know them, sing along. If not, just enjoy the music as a praise to God.
Rejoicing. 